Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can I get a thumbs up just to make sure I'm audible here? Nice. All right. So welcome. Uh, for anyone who's wondering, that is that was a selection of um, rebel music, Sandinista rebel music from uh, Carlos Mejia Godoy, brought to you or selected by uh, our outreach coordinator, Carlos Quintero. So thank you, Carlos. So welcome to our virtual seminar, uh, The Border and Its Bodies, uh, The Embodiment of Risk in the US-Mexico Borderlands. Uh, and this is part of the University of Arizona Southwest Center series. We're so grateful for your participation and truly gratified to see a, a really great turnout for, for the event this afternoon. So thank you so much. Um, to start off, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone that the University of Arizona's Tucson campus occupies the lands of the Tahana Atom and Pascuayaki peoples. Um, and also that the state of Arizona is the homeland of more than 21 other tribal nations. Uh, we respect their cultures and histories as well as those of indigenous peoples everywhere. My name is Jeff Bannister. I'm the director of the Southwest Center. We are a uh, research and outreach unit in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, and our job, our work is to deepen understanding of the US Southwest and the Northwest Mexico region. And this includes, of course, the borderlands. Um, and among other things, the Southwest Center is the publisher of Journal of the Southwest. Uh, and we also have a book series with the University of Arizona Press, which is the publisher of the book, The Border and Its Bodies. Um, and that book is the, uh, the research for that book is the foundation for most of what you'll be hearing in today's, uh, well, uh, today's seminar. We also uh, are extremely grateful for the support of the Amarin Museum of Dragoon, uh, which is not only co uh, the co-sponsor of today's event, but has from the beginning supported the research that's gonna be presented today. So many thanks to Amaran, we're, we're truly grateful for your support. Um, before I turn things over to my Southwest Center colleague, Tom Sheridan, uh, I just wanna take care of a couple of quick um, housekeeping items in terms of the mechanics and the format for today's seminar. Um, each of our speakers will offer a short presentation, 15 to 20 minutes, somewhere in that, in that range. Um, and then following that, we're gonna open the floor up for your questions and you can send those uh, to us uh, via the chat box at any time. Um, and then we're going to be recording this seminar as well, and we'll make the recording available to you um, shortly down the road via our YouTube channel. So we'll send you out uh, all of you notice when that um, when that is available. So today we'll run till probably about 145, a little bit over time if we need to, um, depending on how things go, and we'll do our best to get everybody's uh, questions in. Um, in some cases, we might have to just join questions together if they're similar. So we'll, we'll just see how all of that goes. Um, so thank, thanks again to everyone for joining us this afternoon for uh, what I'm sure will be a very interesting event. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Tom Sheridan. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Jeff. And, and thanks, Carlos, for all the work you've done to make that, this happen. I also want to thank the people here at the Little Chapel of All Nations for all the help that they've given us. And that's where the Southwest Center is, is located. The seminar that you're going to hear today developed out of a four-day research seminar organized by Dr. Randall McGuire and myself that was held at the Ameren Foundation back in March of 2016. 12 anthropologists gathered their draft papers in hand to talk about how the US Border Patrol's policy of quote, prevention through deterrence had affected the most basic unit of human society, the human body in the US-Mexico borderlands. After the seminar was over, we all returned to our universities in Mexico and Canada, as well as the United States uh, to revise our paper, which became uh, a volume of the same name, published, uh, co-edited by Dr. McGuire and myself, and published in the Ameren series at the University of Arizona Press, as Dr. Bannister has, has indicated. The book was published in 2019. It's fitting that Dr. Uh, Robin Reinecke and Dr. Rebecca Crocker are here today because their dissertation research is what gave me the idea to organize this project in the first place. 
Soon after arriving in graduate school, uh, Dr. Reinecke went to work for the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office, which was being overwhelmed by the number of human remains that were being found in the US-Mexico borderlands. And so Dr. Reinecke became the liaison between the office and the families of dead and missing migrants. And that those experiences, those very heart-wrenching experiences caused her to co-found the Colibri Center for Human Rights. Meanwhile, Dr. Rebecca Crocker was doing her research on uh, migrants who had survived the crossing and were living in Tucson, but also living in fear of deportation at any time amidst the rising xenophobia of the early 20, 21st century. And she was looking at the toll that uh, prevention through deterrence had taken on their bodies, the isolation, anxiety, depression, diabetes, hypertension, and other stress-related illnesses. So uh, we have the two poles of people who did not make it and people who did, but who both suffered traumatic experience in the borderlands. Two major concepts guided us uh, as the project developed. One was the concept of embodiment, the idea that the human body represents the location where the biological and the social interact. Prevention through deterrence deployed the mountains and deserts of the US-Mexico borderlands as its greatest weapon. Those mountains and deserts did not deter but they did maim and kill. But our research also supported, was supported by another central concept, and that was the concept of structural violence. In the words of anthropologist Paul Farmer, social inequality is at the heart of structural violence. Racism of one form or another, gender inequality, and above all, brute poverty in the face of affluence are linked to social plans and programs ranging from slavery to the current quest for unbridled quote, growth, unquote. At our seminar, forensic anthropologist Angela Soler and her colleagues <clears throat> discussed the results of their work at the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office. Many of the human remains exhibited traces of malnutrition and chronic infection etched in bones and teeth. Malnutrition and infection that blighted them in early influence in, in infancy and early childhood. As Dr. Green will point out, uh, the indigenous people from Southern Mexico and Central America have suffered centuries of racism, exploitation, and brute poverty reflected in the uh, only archive that survives death in the desert, their bones and their teeth. A common trope among those who support the policy is that migrants choose to risk their lives in the US-Mexico borderlands. <coughs> As a nation of immigrants, we forget the quote unquote choices that our own ancestors made to board the coffin ships in Ireland during the potato famine, where more than a million Irish peasants died from starvation or disease, to leave Eastern Europe or Russia during the pogroms that periodically targeted Jews. Do mothers in Honduras and El Salvador choose to put their children on La Bestia, the trade heading north from Guatemala, the Guatemala-Mexico border, to escape gang violence fueled in part by our insatiable demand for drugs? Do women choose the likelihood of rape as they travel through Mexico 
and put their lives in the hands of coyotes along the border. Such brutal realities make a travesty of the word choice. So without further ado, I am going to turn the program to my colleague in the School of Anthropology, Linda Green, who is going to give us a brief background uh, on U.S. involvement in Central America that has contributed to the crisis there, and then talk about her own work with indigenous women, women from Central America as well. So, uh, Linda, carry on. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom, I want to thank both you and Randy McGuire for putting that initial uh, four-day workshop together, which was really um, quite incredible intellectually. And also to Jeff Bannister, director of the Center, Southwest Center, and for the lecture series, and Carlos Quintero for helping to organize this in a really lovely way. So in the few minutes I have, um, I'll start with a joke. I work in Guatemala and, and in Guatemala, when they ask you to do a history, people usually start from 500 years ago, but I'm gonna spare you that and only start in the 1950s. And I wanna do this by trying to answer two questions, both why do they come? Uh, because that's, that's very much a question in the popular media. And uh, then what do we owe them? And that comes out of our own responsibility that is uh, in the United States for what has happened in Central America. And I'm going to base my remarks uh, mostly on Guatemala, although they encompass the same kinds of processes and practices uh, in El Salvador and Honduras as well. It's just that I'm much more familiar with what has happened in Guatemala. It's also the largest country in the region and the most dominant. Um, and these three Northern Triangle countries, as we refer to them now, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, share very much the same trajectories in, in, their, his, in their history. I'm gonna start the history um, by uh, looking in mid-century, 20th century, and particularly the 1954 U.S.-sponsored CIA coup of the democratically elected government of Jokovo Arbenz. He was the second of the two democratically elected presidents at that time, nothing before in Guatemalan history had there ever been an, a democratic election. Those two comprised what's now thought of as, by historians as the um, 10 years of spring. And Arbenz was overthrown, according to historians, for three crucial um, reasons. And I think they pertain across the region. And those reasons are one, uh, Arbenz was starting a real agrarian reform. And uh, in the region, the uh, land distribution is and was and continues to be some of the worst in all of Latin America, the most unequal in all of Latin America. Um, and Arbenz was actually really doing a, uh, a uh, agrarian reform. What was taking place, however, and what interested the United States was that agrarian reform was also expropriating lands from U.S. corporations. And one of the predominant ones, but not the only one, was the United Fruit Company. And the United Fruit Company was balking at that expropriation of fallow lands. And the Guatemalan government was offering to pay them the amount of money they said their land was worth each time they filed their taxes. And United Fruit was not happy. There's two things that are really important about the United Fruit response. This was during the Eisenhower regime. And John Foster Dulles was the Secretary of State. And his brother, Alan Dulles, was head of the CIA. And both of them were on United Fruit board. So we have that. The second reason for the underlying, for this involvement of U.S. in this coup has to do with what they deemed the communist threat, that Arbenz actually had communists in his cabinet and in his administration, uh, particularly the uh, Workers' Party, the Guatemalan Workers' Party in Guatemala. Now, in Guatemala, as in many places in the world, people aren't 
all freaked out about communism like they are in the United States. And remember when this was happening, it was right in the middle of the Red Scare. So the idea that there were communists and this was got somehow going to convert the whole region, particularly Salvador and Honduras, which were in their own upheavals, uh, to, uh, the, to set a precedent that communism was going to take over Latin America right at our doorstep. Remember, we consider this our backyard, as famously as Ronald Reagan said. And the third reason brought up by Jim Candy, a Canadian historian on Guatemala, I think is really crucial to understanding what's going on. Jim talked about, in particular, the organizing in the rural areas by indigenous peoples and by non-indigenous peoples, both together and separately, for actual real democracy at the local level. And that's a huge threat to the Guatemalan state. The Guatemala, Guatemala is a country ruled by minority rule. The vast majority of the population in Guatemala is indigenous. And this is one of the only countries left in the world under minority rule. Okay, so the indigenous peoples have been suppressed, repressed, and uh, recipients of genocide over the 500 years. And the idea that they might rise up is incredibly um, dangerous for the Guatemalan state. So that happens. Okay, so there's a successful coup and a military dictator reemerges. They roll back all of the gains that uh, Arbenz had put in place and uh, they killed a large number of people, uh, particularly in the countryside, most of it undocumented. Okay, but then the US also goes on to help install what one could call soft democracy, uh, in which uh, long-term sy systemic violence of gender, ethnic, and class oppression is reinvigorated. And the US and the private sector form a shadow government housed in the national palace where parallel government ministries are overseen by the U.S. state. So there's a very large footprint. Also, the World Bank is involved, etc. So there's lots of things going on. This becomes what the U.S. military and defense establishment consider Operation PB Success, a CN, a CIN, CIA Cronapterman, and a model that could be used for other regime changes in Latin America. This was considered a success. But perhaps the most insidious legacy of this time, beyond its scope, intensity, and duration, was the selective killings and outright massacres, as well as rape and overkill of women. And this continues till today. The Guana, so we have that first iteration, the 1954 coup, the repression. By 1960, you have uh, an insurrection starting to happen in the eastern part of Guatemala, uh, uh, provoked by former young military officers who are disgusted with the Guatemalan military for allowing the CIA to train the Bay of, for the Bay of Pigs invasion against Cuba on Guatemalan soil. Uh, that that uh, insurrection is brutally repressed. The um, remnants of that, the people involved in that, move over to the Western Highlands where the vast majority of Mayan people live and start organizing there for a, uh, a violent overthrow of, of the uh, Guatemalan government. That was somewhat um, common across the entire Americas at the time. But the other thing that was going on was uh, the involvement of the church in liberation theology and Christian-based communities that were allowing people to see the reality of their lives and the ways they might try to change that. These were unarmed civilian people working locally to overturn the oppression and repression that they had been living for their entire lives. Uh, and that, I argue in my own book, was a, a crucial piece of why this over, why the U.S. became so involved in counterinsurgency. The counterinsurgency of the, um, the between 1960, if you will, and 1996, uh, when the peace accords were finally uh, signed, put an end to that war, but the U.S. footprint remains deeply embedded in Guatemala. 
Now, the U.S. trained, funded, and supplied the Guatemalan military with the tools for counterinsurgency. And this was declared a genocide within the Guatemalan court system. And Rios Montt, who you might have seen in an earlier uh, advertisement for this seminar, um, was convicted of genocide. The first time anywhere in the world someone has been tried on genocide in their own country and convicted. Unfortunately, within 10 days, it was overturned by the Constitutional Court on a technicality. It's a funny technicality, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, so we have genocide happening. Um, of the, over those 36 year period, 80% of the people killed were killed between 1980 and 1984 in the highlands of Guatemala. The vast majority were unarmed Mayan people, slaughtered. And 600 of those massacres were documented. We don't know how many more there are because that wasn't the full accounting. So as you can see, the US footprint is all over the place. They signed the peace accords in 1996. The US and as well as the UN are involved in that. But what do those peace accords actually do? They're, a, they're an agreement between the military and the armed insurgency. The vast number of Guatemalan people are left out of this uh, accord. And the accords by design did little to redress the virulent racism and the social inequalities that mark Guatemalan society for the majority of the people. And that was by design. And what those accords did was put in place two conditions favorable for the continuation of war against the Mayan people. That is neoliberal economic policies of austerity and impunity for those who committed the crimes. And I'm gonna come back to that because that impunity is not just on at the national level, it's at the local level. And that starts to uncover why so many people are coming. The vast majority of the women I've worked with who are seeking asylum are young Mayan women, and I've done 100 cases in asylum court in the last 10 years, are young Mayan women fleeing from the very provinces where the vast majority of those massacres took place. And there has been no accountability for that whatsoever. Now, my first work in Guatemala was right at the tail end of the counterinsurgency war. So when I went to look at how Mayan widows from those massacres were trying to survive without any men in their communities. And in the communities where I worked, 25% of the men were gone. Husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, everybody's gone. Okay, so these young women are the children and, count and grandchildren of counterinsurgency. Why are they coming, right? The, the place is a mess. Guatemala is a mess. And it's a mess for a number of reasons. And, and I just want to insert here just um, anecdotally, um, I, I was in Guatemala at the end of the counterinsurgency war. So 1988 to 1991, where I worked, the massacres were, had already occurred. There were some still disappearances. It was terribly, it was deeply militarized, but it, the war had ostensibly ended. It was a very frightening time to say the least, but I'm more afraid in Guatemala today than I was 30 years ago. And that's what I want to explain. Why? Why is it so awful now? Well, one, the violence is, is everywhere and, uh, there, and it just runs rampant. And it particularly is bad, both in the cities, the two major cities, but it's bad in the rural countryside, particularly where the drug routes run through. The international trafficking organizations run 80% of the cocaine that comes to the United States through Guatemala. So sure, you have you know, the Sinaloa, the Zetas and all that, but they have a whole network that goes right down into those local communities. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention that that kind of statistic would be impossible, 80%, if there wasn't complicity by the people who are running the Guatemalan state. And the Guatemalan military both ex-military, former military, and current are deeply involved in that trafficking. And that trafficking is not just drugs and human trafficking. Uh, the cartels have very wisely, as narco-capitalists, 
diversified. So we have that going on. So there's a lawlessness and the lawlessness comes down into those rural areas. And who are those people? Many of the people are with blood on their hands from the counterinsurgency war because the, the Guatemalan military was brilliant in the fact that they forcibly recruited in most cases, but sometimes voluntarily used Mayan people as the soldiers, the foot soldiers in that war. So those are the people who actually did the killing. Many of those people are in charge at the local level, and there is ongoing impunity. The, also, the local gangs who have moved in, and there's nothing you can do in these communities without paying extortion. So you want to operate your tienda, you want to open it, you pay an extortion rate once a week. So you have that kind of lawlessness. The police, are a um, vast majority are non-Indigenous people, and that harbor the same racist values and ideas and practices as the entire country does against indigenous peoples. Remember Tom said how poor it is. 80% of the kids in Guatemala are stunted because of malnutrition. 60% sixth, where the, Guatemala is the sixth highest country in the world for chronic malnutrition, and they have a lot of competition. And this is a tiny country. So how is that the case? While the World Bank defines Guatemala as a medium developing country, not as the poorest of the poor, and yet they have uh, six highest in the world chronic malnutrition. Just give you a slight little look at how bad it is for indigenous peoples. So you have the corrupt police who are repressive, racist, and misogynist, because I work with women. <clears throat> and then you have the drought. Guatemala is considered a mega drought. The climate change across the entire region is absolutely devastating to people. These are people who grow rain-fed crops and the rain does not come at the right time. So there's long-term starvation going on in these communities. And then, as I said, the impunity. And so what's happened, why are these Mayan women coming or the women coming from El Salvador and Guatemala, I mean, in uh, Honduras, and I'm, I'm just gonna index women because that's who I work with mostly, although some kids fleeing gang violence, is domestic violence and it's brutal and awful. And even though domestic violence is not new to Guatemala, the intensity of it is phenomenal. For example, the women I worked with, the women who flee, only flee after, for the, and this is, this is true across the board in domestic violence from what I understand, but what they tell me is they only flee after they've been choked and pass out. And then they realize he's gonna kill them. And so the only thing to do is to run. And the only way to run is to, out of the country because there is no safe place in Guatemala. So what do we owe them? Who are we? And what should we do? Because we, we deprecate these women as they come to the border. We don't receive them properly. And we deport about 90% of them. And even those who do get an immigration hearing, which is a very small percentage, only four to five percent of them are granted asylum. So we're talking minute numbers of people, and yet these people are being sent back to the very place they fled for their lives from. And given where the U.S. is and what we've done and ongoing, and I don't want to leave it just back at 54 in the 70s or 80s under Reagan, this is Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. And I think we have to be very clear about that. You know, Biden says he's going to give $4 billion and he's, you know, going to attack the root causes. But Obama, under, with Biden actually directing the program, gave a billion back in 2014 for the same reasons. And half of it went to the security forces. Human rights violators got half of that billion dollars to attack the root causes. Will that happen again under Biden? I don't know, but I think from my perspective, we as American citizens and this foreign policy is carried out in our name, need to step up and take responsibility and take care of these people as they're fleeing violence 
At the same time, we try to work with them to address those causes. Because the vast majority of the people I know do not want to come here. They want to stay home. The only other thing I want to end with is we need to also think of this as an ethnocide because the vast majority of the people who are coming are indigenous peoples, not only from Guatemala, but from El, El Salvador, Honduras, and Southern Mexico. And I'll end there. I hope it didn't go on too long, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Let me just explain the order we're going to go in. Uh, next will be Dr. Robin Reinecke, then Dr. Rebecca Crocker, and finally we'll end with Vicki Gabeka, who is uh, head of the Southern, Borders Southern Border Communities Coalition, who will be talking about her work uh, in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands today to bring it up to date. So now I'd like to turn it over to Robin Reinecke to talk about her work with the border and its bodies. Robin. Thank you. And um, thank you, Tom and Carlos, for putting together um, this panel and to my fellow co-panelists for being here today. Um, it's great to finally talk about the book. It was launched in 2020, and we all know what happened. Um, so it's nice to return to this work. Um, just gonna share screen. Can you all see that? Okay, great. Um, I just wanna begin with um, an announcement of another um, uh, item for you all to read, which is an updated report about the loss of life um, and the data from the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner here in Tucson. Um, my colleague, Dr. Daniel Martinez in sociology and a number of other um, scholars um, worked with the Binational Migration Institute to update their series of reporting on this um, issue. Um, our intent is to support the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner in organizing and releasing and publicizing this data so that it can be used, these data, excuse me, um, in especially in policy conversations. And just to follow up with what Linda was just saying, um, this is not a partisan issue. Um, the consensus that um, the consensus on the part of the US federal government that um, we're willing to sacrifice human life in the name of border uh, security has been a tradition um, since at least the late 90s. Um, and I'll post um, links to the report, which is in both Spanish and English. Um, but the other thing to emphasize before I begin, of course, is simply that this, if you look at the loss of life over time, it's very clear that this was not a significant problem um, whereby hundreds of people were dying until a US federal border policy change. And that happened in 1994 and then was implemented in 2000 and 2001 um, in Arizona. So um, the, in this talk though, um, I'm, well, I look back at the chapter and it had been a little while since I'd returned to that material, um, which was good to do. And I think the main point that I was trying to get across in my chapter was that the violence is not just in the deaths, but it's in how the deaths happen and how the bodies are treated. Um, so just to emphasize that um, when we see all of these little red dots and that horrific tragedy that we've witnessed here in Southern Arizona in the past 20, 30 years, obviously each of those is a family that's deeply impacted by that traumatic death or disappearance. And in the case of those who have been able to find remains, what they receive um, is fragments of a human body um, that has been destroyed due to um, the same factors which led to death in the desert. So um, obviously I wanna provide a, a trigger warning here. I don't have any slides with human remains. I have one slide where you can see, um, actually I have one slide with skeletal remains and I'll, I'll provide a warning for that. But um, if you uh, would like to get a copy of this paper that doesn't contain in, any images, I'm happy to, um, well, I'll refer you to the book. <laughs> um, so there are practices of care that counter the, the, the violent procedures that impact the dead. Um, and I'm gonna trace both of those um, procedures. 
Um, just by way of introduction and explaining um, where my observations come from, um, I, as a graduate student, um, like Tom Sheridan said, um, when I first got here in 2006, I started graduate school at the University of Arizona's um, School of Anthropology at the same time as I started volunteering um, and learning directly from the um, forensic anthropologist at the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner. Um, I now am seeing what I did in terms of participatory action research, that I was involved in a local community process. And this wasn't just the medical examiner's office, but many other groups um, from the community concerned about the loss of life on the border. And I really joined two communities at the same time when I came to Tucson. Um, so the research was grounded in responding to um, the need from the families of uh, missing migrants who were really um, angered that there wasn't a clearer process for them to find information about missing loved ones. So um, theoretically, the framework that I'm using here um, is necroviolence, which is a term that um, Jason De Leon used in his book, The Land of Open Graves. But it's a concept that um, has been traced by anthropologists and others for a long time. And it's basically um, focusing on the symbolic violence um, inherent in the destruction of human remains and how incredibly damaging that is both for um, the living, for people who witness those remains, for the families. And it can also be seen as um, what Alex Hinton calls a priming mechanism for, for future violence and for future genocidal violence. So once there's normalization that some people's bodies can be treated um, like non-humans, um, then brutalizing the living becomes more normalized. Um, and just to um, trace a very brief history, and um, I have to be careful not to go too long here because there's a very long history. Um, like Dr. Green said, you could go back 500 years, but the history that I'm focused on here um, is more about um, the ways in which the border the US-Mexico border has been used traditionally as a mechanism for racialized violence and specific to the human body, so just specifically directed at the human body. So I'm just going to discuss a few brief, um, briefly discuss a few um, historic uh, chapters of this. Um, and the first and most relevant is Jim Crow era in Texas, um, especially between 1910 and 1920. If you haven't read it, um, I highly uh, recommend um, Monica Munoz Martinez's book, The Injustice Never Leaves You. She goes through um, what there is in the archives of uh, records of this violence um, and estimates that between 1848 and 1928 in Texas alone, 232 ethnic Mexicans were lynched by vigilante groups of three or more people. Um, and, and there's many of these cases that never made it into the archives. And that lack of record keeping is another theme that I'm gonna trace. Um, and the remains of those who were killed were left um, to be exposed to the elements, were dismembered, were harmed, otherwise um, brutalized. Then, of course, there were line inspections, um, fumigation, and delousing, um, especially in the 1920s. Um, and uh, this actually, the, the fumigation process actually included the use of Zyklon B, which was later used um, in um, Nazi extermination camps. Excuse me. Um, and then, of course, it has to be noted that the 1924 Johnson Reed Act happened at the same time as the establishment of Border Patrol. And Johnson Reed Act was created in the context of eugenics. Um, this was a eugenic based law, and it was designed to um, invite more immigrants from desirable red white countries and to suppress immigration from um, countries uh, constructed to be non white. Um, and this really tamped down on the physical line inspections for Mexicans and no line inspections um, for non mex for Europeans in Ellis Island. Um, so the, it's also important to note that the establishment of Border Patrol actually happened under the Department of Labor in this year, 1924. 
Um, and my um, Nye's work, Impossible Subjects, is a critically important history of the creation of Border Patrol as what she calls a unique police force for um, Latin American laborers. And then, of course, there was Operation Wetback. I apologize for the horrifying language. Um, that was the, this happened during the Bracero era. Um, and I'm just using this archival image once again to emphasize the very specialized treatment of certain bodies and the ways in which bodies and images of the treatment of bodies circulated at that time, um, performing um, who could be treated like animals or rounded up like cattle um, and um, deported. Um, Kelly Little Hernandez writes of Operation Wetback, it was lawless, it was arbitrary, it was based on a lot of xenophobia, and it resulted in a sizable, large, insizable large-scale violations of people's rights, including the forced deportation of U.S. citizens. And Leo Chavez, um, anthropologist um, and author of the Latino Threat Narrative, he traces some of this history as well and emphasizes um, basically you know, the symbolic specter of the threatening Latino migrant body as coming to be a stand in for any threat facing the homeland, whether it's crime, terrorism, disease, or culture change, that basically the Latino body is used in imagery and rhetoric to emphasize um, fears of um, foreignness and, and fears of all of these other social, social factors. So um, getting into, um, what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna look at symbolic violence and the destru destruction or harm of dead bodies on the borderlands in, in three different sites, um, in the desert borderlands, in the lab, and in their final disposition. Now, at each of these sites, there are acts of care that resist um, efforts to harm the dead and disappear the dead. Um, but of course, they happen in this larger context where so much harm has already been done. So first, um, in the desert borderlands, um, this is a photograph that I took with, um, I was privileged to be able to join the group um, Armadillos Busqueda y Rescate in early 2020 before everything changed. And I joined them to go out and um, do a search for human remains that actually had already been found by the group. Now they're an amazing group that's immigrant led and they do search and recovery and search and rescue in the borderlands. Um, they were returning to a site about two weeks after finding skeletal remains and reporting them to the authorities and they wanted to see if those remains had been recovered. So I'm not going to show an image of the remains here, but I will show the remains were indeed still there, um, a full skeleton. So the authorities had not um, been out to recover the remains, which is something that both Armadios and um, No More Deaths have been documenting, just the failure to recover or incomplete recoveries being done by state authorities. Um, and the volunteers created this beautiful cross, which you can't see it, but it's got wildflowers tucked into it, um, made of choya branches. Um, so in the borderlands, this issue of you know, failure to recover is one thing, um, but just the conditions in which migrants die and where people are pushed into the desert, it means that if they are found and recovered quickly, they're usually already highly decomposed, skeletal, their remains have been preyed upon by animals. Um, there are reports at the medical examiner's office of you know, family dogs bringing in elements to the back door, border patrol driving along and hearing a crunch and realizing it's a human skull. Um, the remains are highly decomposed, disarticulated, and really have been left um, to be exposed to the elements. Um, and then, Practices of care are done, of course, by groups like Armadillos, also by migrants themselves. Um, this is a photograph by my friend Michael Hyatt, um, longtime uh, humanitarian on the border, of a stretcher that was made by migrants to carry the body of Beatrice, who had fallen to her death, and the group um, refused to leave her remains behind and carried them on a stretcher. And you can see the um, material used is local trees, but also the, they tore the underwear bands out of their clothing and their own socks um, to construct the stretcher. Um, then there's um, violent processes in the lab, um, the lack of care, lack of investigation, um, harm of the dead that happens in the lab. 
And I kind of in that chapter worked through, you know, just how destructive autopsy and forensic anthropology methods are. I don't see that as violence. I see that as an attempt to care for the dead, to try to identify them. But it's, a, again, one of these instances where so much damage has already been done that you have to go even further in order to back mm -hmm. out of that and try to help the person, you know, care for that dead person and hopefully provide the family with answers. Um, but there are um, places along the border where the remains are not properly cared for, um, not properly examined. Um, there have been numerous counties, both in Arizona um, and mostly in Texas, where remains have been buried um, before autopsy, before forensic anthropology exam. Um, some I saw that um, Justin Myers is here and maybe some others that were involved in exhumations in South Texas. Um, and they found, um, you know, the examining gloves had been thrown in with the remains and other trash and just pretty extreme um, demonstration of disrespect. Also poor record keeping, lack of records, sloppiness. Um, this is um, a photograph taken of my colleague, Dr. Um, Caitlin Vogelsberg at the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner, uh, my longtime um, partner um, in research and um, care. And that office um, really demonstrates um, what forensic science can do in terms of care and, and restoration and recovery. Um, and their efforts have been um, internationally noted um, for being um, practices of care. Um, and then the third and final um, air, uh, site in which you see postmortem violence is upon um, release um, for burial. Um, or in final disposition. Um, these photos are taken, the first one's in Brooks County, and I believe that the one on the right, that actually might be Brooks as well, but um, there was a similar grave in Webb County and similar graves um, all over Southern Texas when um, uh, researchers from the Binational Migration Institute visited there in 2012. Um, remains had been buried, like I said, um, with you know trash thrown in, suggesting you know those who were maybe doing the exam did not show respect for the dead, but also upon burial, um, the remains were buried irregularly, often unmarked, um, with bone bones kind of askew, which is an irregular burial. Typically, bone, burials where there's um, care being expressed, there's not bones and legs and parts akimbo, but things are placed with deliberation, you know, deliberate care. Robin. Um, Robin, no more than five minutes. Yep, I'm almost done. Thank you. I appreciate it. I haven't been watching the time. Um, and some of the um, good folks doing the care work to exhume the dead. Um, this is the one photograph containing um, skeletal remains. I apologize. I forgot to provide a warning. Um, they found um, remains in body bags with trash uh, buried very close to the surface sometimes um, remains in milk crates or um, just kind of without any, any body bag or coffin at all. Um, and it, it was largely student groups led by several forensic anthropology professors who did this work of exhumation. Um, so there were teams from Texas State University, Baylor University, and the University of Indianapolis. Um, working hard to undo some of the damage of these um, poor burials. It should also be mentioned that um, Cremations is something that's happened in Southern Arizona for the unidentified dead for many, many of the last 20 years. That's a practice that only recently is coming to an end. Um, and that's a really problematic um, thing to do for unidentified human remains and is pretty much under international humanitarian law is not allowed. Um, so in conclusion, um, the destruction of dead bodies has been used throughout history during war and peace to publicly mark the bodies of outsiders or criminals. Um, so to leave bodies unattended or uncared for, it's a profound act of violence and it terrorizes the living and it marks the dead um, and members of their community as threatening outsiders um, who are essentially subhuman. Um, and like I mentioned before, I mean, um, Hinton describes this kind of um, treatment of the dead as something that can be um, seen as a priming mechanism that can normalize dehumanizing racialized violence. De Leon um, argues that this kind of violence is generative and can produce further forms. Um, so just uh, in conclusion, it's, it's 
a big deal that the remains are treated this way. And it's something that um, I think forensic anthropologists along the border and some of the groups that I've mentioned are working really hard to document. Um, it should also be noted that the families of the missing and the dead are increase, increasingly um, more and more active and engaged in speaking out about what happened to them and doing um, very active, what I'm looking at is um, forensic citizenship work to find their loved ones and document what happened um, on the border. So thank you so much to all my panelists and of course, Colibri, Center for Human Rights, the Southwest Center and the Medical Examiner's Office. Um, I have some citations and I'm happy to post that in the chat if anybody wants that. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Crocker. We'll be talking about her work with uh, people who have been able to cross the border and are living, were living in Tucson. Rebecca. Thank you, Tom. And it's great to be with you all today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Carlos is going to share my presentation when he's ready. And I just want to thank Tom for all your work in putting this panel together in addition to the workshop that brought us all in conversation about this topic initially, um, as well as to Carlos Quintero and Jeff Bannister from the Southwest Center for hosting us today. I'm really grateful to be speaking after Robin and after Linda, who are close colleagues of mine, and I have so much respect for their work and their dedication to this topic. And I hope that you'll see that our presentations today really follow a continuum of embodied experience. And the piece that I'll be speaking about today is entitled The Body Keeps the Score, Embodied Impacts of Mexican Migration to Arizona. Go ahead to the next slide, Carlos, thank you. So, the research problem that really drove this, this research is, is a phenomenon in the health sciences called the immigrant epidemiological paradox. And one side of the paradox is that Mexicans actually arrive surprisingly healthy to the United States, but they quickly lose these health advantages um, after arrival, they begin to decline. And this can be seen in areas of health that affect the life course, including birth outcomes, obesity, and the many comorbidities that we see in chronic disease and mental health. And because there are the current explanatory frameworks to try to understand why this is happening are insufficient, it continues to be called a paradox because you would expect that when people are coming from the kinds of situations that you heard Linda speaking about today and coming to a country that's far more developed with a more modern healthcare system, you would expect to see the opposite occurring. And so we, we have this paradox, which is very well documented, but poorly understood. And my interest as a graduate student working with Tom Sheridan was what can the lens of emotional experience add to our understanding of the paradox? So why use emotion? Uh, I was interested in this for several reasons. One is that I think emotion is fundamentally a really great way to understand the context in which we live because our individual emotional experiences are all based on perception meaning that we are all experts of our own emotional lives that we live. We're all the, the best people who we could speak to about that topic. And because emotions directly reflect what we live, it's literally emotions are one of the prime ways that we embody our life context, that we embody the structural forces that surround us in our day-to-day -day lives. And so it's a really excellent way to, to see that embodied process of how we bring the outside world into our bodies. And because of this, this is a quote by Lutz and White that I really love, that emotions are potential sources of correct knowledge about the social world. If we all are experts of that experience, then documenting emotional experience is, a, is actually a source of knowledge that we're not looking at enough. One of the other reasons why I really was encouraged to use emotion as a lens is because there's a very well-developed field of the science of emotion. This is not a piece that I study, but I call on it a lot in my research because it's really fascinating and it's much far, it's really more developed than most of us realize. If you look at all of these individual emotions that I've listed here, they all have their own individual neural pathways. I think sometimes we tend to lump all emotion into stress and sort of think it's all doing one thing in our bodies, but it, it's not. Uh, for example, persistent fear has been show, shown to cause depression, hypertension, and insulin, insulin resistance. Whereas loneliness, which of course we're paying a lot of attention to now with the pandemic, but even before COVID-19 hit, loneliness was really being considered as an international public health crisis. Loneliness is visible on an MRI as visibly as physical pain. 
and it carries the same level of damage to the body as excessive smoking and uh, drinking. Whereas chronic stress, which we're probably most familiar with, can permanently rewire the immune system. So we have this incredible body of knowledge about the kind of damage that stressful emotions can do to us. And we know enough about the migration experience, thanks to all of the amazing scholars who have documented this, that migration entails multiple emotional triggers that are very severe. We have physical dislocation from home and from people. We have separation, often very long-term, from loved ones and from community. And we have the process of adapting to novel environments, which are often very harsh and unfriendly in new environments. And so you take those two pieces together and you can see that there probably is a lot of relevant pieces to look at in terms of the emotional experience of migration. The third piece that really interested me about emotion, and this comes from decades of working in Mexican origin communities, both in the United States and in Mexico, through friendships and family relationships and all sorts of community work, is that Mexicans' healing knowledge is a really under-referenced source of health data as well. And I say that because while Mexico has a very pluralistic medical arena and there's no one way that, that Mexicans view healing or health, we do see a lasting influence of pre-colonial indigenous knowledge based on spiritual and herbal healing, as well as the lasting influences of, of influ influences that came through colonization, including from throughout Europe and Africa. And these influences combine to give a lot of Mexicans a very embedded definition of health, which means that they have a naturally embodied vision of, of health. And that's one of the reasons why I really like to use embodiment for this work was because I don't feel like it was me as an academic coming and imposing it from the outside. I think it's very true to how a lot of people see their, see their own health. So it's very easy to see that the individual is assumed to be inextricably tied to, uh, to, his, to his or her environment via the soul. And therefore your body and your health is an extension of your day-to-day -day life. And if illness is, illness therefore comes from a, an, an imbalance that's born from that embeddedness. And there are a lot of traditional ideologies in Mexico. I just wanna mention two quickly because they were gonna come up later in an illness narrative that I'm gonna share with you. The first is susto, which is the body's response to an intense tr uh, trigger or, or trauma in which the soul is temporarily dislodged from the body. And while susto is not considered to be an, an illness necessarily in and of itself, it does make the body potentially more vulnerable to other illnesses. And there is actually quite a bit of literature, for example, on linking susto with the onset of diabetes and depression in addition to other diseases. The second one that I will mention quickly is nervios, which is one of the most common traditional diagnoses in Mexico, but also throughout Latin America. Um, that's born more from a generalized condition of stress, from anxiety producing producing a situation that somebody doesn't have control over and generally is reflective of low social status. And I think what, what I was really interested to see in this research is what can these illness narratives that are steeped in this indigenous knowledge that I'm just speaking you, to you about very briefly, but has an amazing and fascinating huge literature surrounding it. Um, how, what can that tell us about how migration in, um, affects emotional and therefore physical health declines that might make the paradox seem less paradoxical? So my basic research questions were, what is the lived experience um, of for Mexican immigrants in Tucson? How do Arizona's history of migration and recent political shifts shape the stressors experienced by them? And lastly, how do immigrants understand this emotional health to affect their pain? And it's primarily this last piece that I'll speak to you about today. Very briefly, this work that I'm gonna be speaking with you about today is all based on research done here, basically on the south side of Tucson. This was back in 2013 and 2014. And I worked for over a year and conducted eth ethnographic interviews with their service providers who directly worked with immigrants as well as with 40 first generation Mexican immigrants. And this was all around the emotional experience that we've been talking about. Also um, was engaged very deeply with my research sites during that time as an English teacher and a language interpreter and engaging in participant observation in relevant community settings. So it has been argued that in order to really understand the emotional experience, we first need to look at the societal forces that produce those emotions. And this ties back to what you've been hearing about throughout the presentations today, is that the context of anti-immigrant policies and 
environments have really produced a lot of stressors that are very clearly going to be sources of emotional stress. So in speaking with the 40 people in my sample, the primary ones that emerged were the desert crossing, which um, the vast majority of men had done in a smaller percentage of women, but clearly tied to an enormous amount of fear and terror. You think about Robin's presentation today and you understand immediately why uh, physical threats to, to life and limb throughout that process. Um, that doesn't abate, you know, as soon as you get here. There were a lot of conversations about how long that trauma lasted and remained for people. Uh, the second being undocumented status, which it affected the majority of my sample and is tied to, you know, really just an inability to engage freely in life in every way that you could think of and not think of. I think there's some obvious ones. We think about fear of, of being arrested, obviously um, limited, limited movement in terms of travel, but there are other smaller things that are equally insidious, honestly, in terms of not being able to participate in civic life and feel free to get a fishing license, to get a discount at a local um, store or at a nature site, right? Because you don't have an ID. There are pieces that just really intersect with almost every part of daily life. And then we have indefinite family separation. And when I say 40% here, that's actually from spouses and children. So from immediate family, this obviously um, really creates disjunctures in family and leads to role loss and responsibility shifts between parents and children, not being able to get home for important um, ceremonies with death, with birth, with other life passages. Uh, the fourth is detention and deportation, which is experienced by over half of my sample and, of course, the ultimate form of loss of freedom and was tied to extreme emotional stress as well as financial stress, which is a piece that we don't pay as much attention to. And lastly, of course, extreme poverty, which was largely based on underemployment due to being uh, essentially excluded legally from the formal labor system, which meant that most forms of employment were part-time, were on the side, which left people very vulnerable to exploitation and discrimination in the workplace. So what I found in, in this sample, I can say that and to, at, at that point in my life, I had never sat with as much sadness and emotional devastation as I did during the course of this research. I have just percentages listed here, but we're talking about people. <laughs> Most of the people in the sample had experienced at two, three or more of these emotions. So we're talking about trauma, fear, loneliness was just epidemic, sadness and generalized stress um, was just a really, really overwhelming experience um, in the sample. And immigrants really closely tie that emotion to sickness. And um, as, as Tom mentioned, there are so many diseases that have a stress link. And sometimes that's well known in the medical literature, but we don't make those connections as much in the social sciences. And that's one of the pieces that I was trying to do was sort of get these bodies of literature to talk to each other a little bit more. Um, but the immigrants in the sample could really narrate their relationship between their stress and high blood pressure, diabetes, headaches, insomnia. Um, definitely sustos and nervios. And I feel like the best way to really help you all understand a, a little bit of what I learned in the course of this project is just to read a short excerpt from an, one of the narratives. And I just want you to keep in mind, and I'm reading that this was one person out of 40 who I interviewed. Um, and there are hundreds and thousands and actually millions of people who each have their own story that you know would be their own version of what you're going to hear right now. And I think when you start to think about it in those terms, it can help you um, help all of us get a sense of how these emotional processes may actually impact health in the way that we see in the, in the, in the paradox. I see Faustino almost every day at my English class for day laborers. Whenever he doesn't have work, he is there at the church waiting. Tall and lanky, Faustino is at once a joker who loves to draw a laugh and also a very self-possessed 40-year-old indigenous man. One day as we stand talking outside the church, I watch him cleaning the dirt from underneath his fingernails with a shard of broken glass without thinking. I take the glass from him and throw it aside and he catches my eye with a grin. I have always had nervios and picked at my fingernails and bitten them because I'm anxious, he explains. My wife says sometimes I do it in my sleep. I think it's about work. When you are suffering from too low resources, you feel a lot of worry and stress and from those worries come illnesses. Because to be healthy, you need to have work. Having work means that the worries end because you have a way to keep going. Faustino knows firsthand what it feels like to not have enough. Growing up on a yaque hido in Western Sonora, he was the youngest of seven children. The first of three died in infancy. 
town was many hours away by bike or border, Faustino explains. And by the time they got to the town where my brothers could be cured, my first brother was already dead. The second one was in the hospital, but since I didn't have the money to pay for the medicines, he died. Faustino's family lived off the beans and vegetables his father harvested, but there was never anything left over. This childhood deprivation drove him to make several dangerous desert crossings in search of greater financial stability in the United States. Each crossing had exhausted his physical stamina and emotional strength. On one journey, his group was attacked by hooded bandits who used a live scorpion to int intimidate and rob the crossers. On that trip, he recalls, when we crossed the border, we saw little kids' bodies already decomposing and old people. It was a real susto that gave me fear and sadness because I thought, what if I end up like them out there? When Faustino crossed again with his wife, he held her hand and carried her to make sure she wasn't left behind. Then days later, after running out of food and water, it was his wife who supported him through the final miles and pleaded with him not to give up. Faustino arrived in Tucson thoroughly exhausted. He recalls, I felt lonely and sad here because I felt like my hands were tied. Like I couldn't really be a good person here and work like I wanted to work. I felt like I was nobody. That's how you feel when you arrive. A key facet of the social alienation that Faustino experienced was the ever-present fear that prevented him from fully participating in his new community due to his undocumented status. I felt afraid even to go to the store. I felt like the police or immigration would get me and I was always trying to take precautions and I didn't feel at ease because you think, what will I do if they kick me out with my family? What will I do in Mexico? Unfortunately, those fears came true on the night his wife was in the hospital giving birth to their second child. Faustino was at home with their toddler when immigration officials knocked on his door. When he could not produce papers, he was promptly taken into custody and deported. While Faustino was able to make it back to his family, his lack of papers made finding stable employment nearly impossible. He remembers, in the past I had so much stress that my mouth was frozen from stress and worry because from stress comes paralysis, like attacks that paralyze the whole body. Because when I had no work, I came to the clinic here at the church and they examined me and they said my blood was really sick. The doctor said I should massage my nerves and my head because I had headaches and nervios. Stress reached traumatic levels when Faustino was detained after getting lost near a border, border patrol checkpoint west of Tucson. The official spoke accusatorily at the workers and Faustino lost his patience. I told them, I am indigenous. I don't know why you are talking to me like that. I told him that he was wrong about us having crossed the border. I told him that I didn't cross the border. The border had crossed me. Faustino remained in immigration lockup for a week, fighting hunger and freezing temperatures in the detention unit that Mexicans in Tucson ubiquitously referred to as La Hilera or the freezer. After that, he was transferred to federal prison in Eloy. While detained, he worked to control his nervios, well aware of how fast things could spiral out of control. I felt sad because I was thinking about my family and how I was going to pay rent for my wife, he recalls. So I asked myself, how will I get out? How will they manage? But I also told myself not to be too worried because if I had thought about it too much, it would lead me to commit something bad. It could lead me to do something to myself. Faustino's community in Tucson raised bail for him and he was released soon after getting to Eloy. He says, when I got home, I felt so free. It's like when a squirrel or other little animal gets stuck in the corral and when it gets out, it runs and jumps and leaps. That is how I felt when I got back to my house. I said, I'm free now, I'm free. And I hugged my wife and my children. So I hope that um, that that one story and what we've talked about today can give you a little bit of a sense of the power of immigrant emotional testimonies and these illness narratives in providing crucial links between immigration policies that we've been hearing about today, emotional hardship and actual sickness that potentially offer tangible solutions for moving forward and promoting greater health and safety. I've listed a couple different catalogs here. One is mitigating factors. And those are, if we take the current situation as it is, what are some of the things that we can do to soften the impact of the current conditions? And those would be supporting local organizing and protecting networks like the kind that helped get Faustino out of prison so quickly. The second would be improving dialogue between immigrants and local police. The third would be increasing access to mental health services, which are really abysmally low and out of reach in this population for many reasons. And the fourth would be giving immigrants local IDs so that they could at least engage more fully in some of the local activities um, that don't necessarily require a state ID, but do require some form of identification that's um, local to the United States. 
But the second segment here is, you know, more fundamental because it's the structural solutions that are going to actually reduce the production of these stressors rather than just trying to soften the blow of them. Uh, these are the bigger pieces like severing ties between ICE and Border Patrol and local policing forces, affording immigrants a legal status um, to be able to live and work in the United States without this constant fear and vigilance and enabling a humanitarian cross-border travel, which could be used to, to go home for you know, important events and medical care and, and um, other necessary things to keep people more sane and happy um, in their time here. And I just wanna thank you all for your attention today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Vicki's contribution next. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And now I'd like to introduce our final presenter, Vicki Galbeka, who is the director of the Southern Border Communities Coalition. Vicki? Thank you for the introduction. Um, you know, before I, did, I didn't pre pre uh, prepare a PowerPoint, um, but I did prepare some remarks. But before I, I, I read those, I would like to I was reminded by these wonderful presentations made by my colleagues. Uh, doctors, you know, Crocker, um, Green, and, and Reinecke, about, I, I was reminded of an experience that I had back in 2014 when I was working for the ACLU and we were um, um, documenting conditions of confinement in a family detention center that existed in Artesia, New Mexico. And I remember, you know, speaking to uh, a woman from Honduras who had fled with her teenage, late teenage daughter and her, I think, nine-year-old son, um, because she was worried about the gangs, co-opting her son into the gangs. And she was also worried about her daughter, who was a lesbian and had her best friend recently killed by the gangs. She was afraid of what was going to happen to her daughter. And, you know, after all the trials and tribulations that she went through in um, the, through the long journey from Honduras to the southern, um, to the U.S.-Mexico border, the traumas that she experienced were vast. And she shared with me that when she arrived in the United States and was apprehended by Border Patrol, she felt relieved initially because she felt that she had finally arrived into the arms of a compassionate nation. And that what she said really stuck with me and has really struck me a lot because I think that a lot of times when we look at our border policies, we don't live up to the propaganda that we send out to the rest of the world about how kind and compassionate and wonderful our US is. So with that, I, I wanna just sort of talk a little bit about you know, what the Southern Border Communities Coalition is. We were we sort of came together back in 2011 with a mission to bring together networks from San Diego, California, all the way to Brownsville, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the main reason we came together was to ensure that border um, enforcement policies and practices were accountable and fair, that they respect human dignity and human rights, and to prevent the loss of life in the region. To be clear, we came together most as a way to address the human and civil rights abuses by U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials that continue to be perpetrated with absolute impunity. We also felt that the U.S. public and the national media were promoting a false narrative about our homes. The southern border region has always been a place of hope, welcoming, and opportunity. We are home to 20 million people we have deeply rich cultural and indigenous history that predates national boundaries and our unique wild, wildlife habitats form the dynamic landscape that is home to endangered species like wolves, jaguars, and ocelots. Southern border cities are some of the safest communities in the country and the region is a key engine of economic growth, an international trade hub that creates jobs and generates wealth. But for decades, border communities have borne the brunt of a deeply misguided, often bipartisan, political strategy that unwisely attempts to offset any meaningful immigration reforms with subjectively defined so-called border security that perennially shifts its goalposts. 
This paradigm has proved to be catastrophic, counterproductive, and costly, not to mention lethal. Um, further heightened by a prevention through deterrence strategy, which my colleagues have already mentioned, which has led to the hyper-militarization hyper of our border communities, a massive erosion of the rights of our community members, increased abuse by border enforcement officials, of, uh, including community members of color, including immigrants with long ties to the region, tribal members, and those seeking protection. This paradigm, this false paradigm, has also resulted in almost zero advances in humane and fair immigration policies. In fact, all we've seen really was under the Obama administration was an administrative program called DACA that was to address, that provided a remedy for immigrant youth. Outside of that, we've seen nothing, but we have seen just tons and tons of law enforcement resources deployed at our border. I submit that this paradigm that we need border security before we do immigration reform has actually become a stumbling block because I don't think there will be a day when anti-immigrant elected officials will say, oh, okay, the border is secure. Let's, let's go, go ahead and do immigration reform. There'll, there'll just never be a day that they will say that. Another thing that brought us together back in 2011 was the brutal killing of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas who was surrounded by almost 20 agents, hogtied in cuffs, lying on the ground, tased at least five times, and severely beaten. He died from his injuries days later in a San Diego hospital. Since January 2010, more than 100 people have died as a result of an encounter with CBP agents and officers, including six people who were standing in Mexico when a border agent fatally shot them while he was standing on the US side. Three of these cross-border shootings were of teenagers. Six children have also died while in border patrol custody. Despite deaths in custody and uses of excessive force, agents aren't held accountable. The agency's discipline system is broken and agency leadership has long failed to stop a trend of corrupt agents. Furthermore, border communities are subjected to border patrols militarized over policing, including roving patrols and dozens of internal checkpoints that subject border region residents to harassment and creates a pervasive climate of fear among our communities. The criminaliz criminalization of migrants is not only inhumane, it is also costly. Currently, the federal government wastes more than $23 billion a year on jailing and deporting immigrants. This includes funding for Customs and Border Protection, the largest law enforcement agency in the country. Better use of that money would be to invest in border governance, such as through improvements for effective and efficient inspections at ports of entry, the creation of welcoming centers to process claims for entry and address humanitarian needs, and establishing pathways for people to rejoin their families or meet workforce demands. The Biden administration must stop funding the militarization of our region and the unaccountable agents who continue to harm our binational, tribal, and multi multicultural communities. With the current challenges that we're facing in the region, our nation has a chance and a responsibility to live up to our values, to do the right thing and develop fair, humane and functional systems to welcome vulnerable newcomers as well as border residents at our southern border. So let's talk about some of the solutions we're putting forth. First and foremost, we need to rethink borders. The border region needs an accountable, rights-respecting governance, not more harmful enforcement, Congress should recognize the profound harms that have resulted from a legacy of deeply misguided border policies grounded in the law enforcement only model or the prevention through deterrence model that have not made us safer as a nation, but instead have threatened the well being and rights of immigrants and border communities, contributed to the loss of life of thousands and wasted billions of taxpayer dollars. Lawmakers, in consultation with border communities, 
must develop a new border governance model. On a typical day, more than 600,000 people cross the land ports of entry at our northern and, and southern borders to visit family and friends, shop, attend school or work, and conduct business. And I should say that this is actually, that average is actually pre-COVID, right? Because now the border is completely closed to non-essential, to anything but um, essential travel. But at the time when we did cross back and forth, we basically were subjected to prolonged wait times, crumbling ports and harassment, often based on racial and religious profiling. A move towards good border governance means investing in infrastructure improvements at ports of entry and adequate accountable personnel to reduce border crossing wait times and to ensure that border regions, residents and newcomers, including asylum seekers are welcomed with humanity and dignity. Good border governance also means restricting the role of border officials at the ports of entry to identify and clear people into the country and refer children and families seeking safety to humanitarian rights respecting agencies and organizations with expertise in protecting the welfare of children, such as trauma specialists and uh, social workers, um, and how to um, protect uh, you know, the rights of vulnerable populations. You know, we in the border region know better than anyone that the challenges we're experiencing right now are not a crisis and they're not new. They stem from the hyper-militarization enforcement only approach to the Southern border over the last almost three decades, which includes policies that criminalize migrants rather than recognize them as human beings, as human bodies. We've noticed a shift in terminology in our current administration towards border management, which to us signals an important and welcome symbolic change, but it's meaningless without an accompanying change in policies. The near total closure of the border to people seeking safety has created confusion and desperation. Thus far, the current administration has refused to rescind harmful policies like Title 42, which under the guise of public health results in immediate expulsions and denies due process to people seeking protection or to reunite with family members in the United, the United States. The administration's slow response in creating a welcoming system also represents an abdication of the United States government's responsibility to the global community. And we urge Congress to take an active role in creating a system to welcome border residents and vulnerable newcomers alike. Good border governance also means that Border Patrol's role is limited to detection between the ports of entry at the actual border with a focus on organized crime and national threats. Border Patrol, nor any government agency, should ever dehumanize or criminalize migrants. Upon encounter, migrants should be treated with dignity and respect, promptly transferred out of Border Patrol custody and provided the opportunity to present their claim for an immigration or humanitarian remedy. This is and should be an administrative proceeding, not a criminal proceeding, and it should be supported through community-based case management, not detention. Furthermore, Border Patrol should not be operating inside the United States far from the international border line to engage in warrantless stops, searches, and seizures. In other words, they should not be running interior checkpoints far from the border or roving patrols through our neighborhoods. And they should also cease to engage in the kind of intrusive surveillance and policing that undermines our civil liberties and human rights that undergird our democracy. Finally, good border governance also means we do not need a border wall, physical or virtual scarring our communities. Over the last few decades, the border has become home to one of the most militarized regions in the world. The deadly border wall built under both Democratic and Republican administrations has divided vibrant communities, put people's lives at risk during floods and natural disasters. And, and by the way, recently we've seen a higher incidence of people who are falling from the 30 foot walls that were built in the last four years and, and experiencing severe injuries and death. Mm -hmm. um, the border wall has also destroyed sacred indigenous and cultural sites. 
So, and, and replacing a physical wall with a virtual or small wall is not a humane or benign alternative to a physical wall and must be sharply restricted. In fact, a smart wall, mass surveillance, and many other technologies present real harms for the environment, infringe on privacy rights of border communities, and could lead to more deaths as border crossers take more dangerous routes to avoid detection. And so in conclusion, I just want to say that we encourage everyone, including our elected congressional members, to help tell the real stories of the southern border and to look at the real data and stories coming from our region. We also encourage policymakers to check out our new border vision, which can be found on our website, southernborder.org, for a glimpse of what good border governance can actually look like. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki, and thanks to Rebecca, to Robin, and to Linda for such an informative and passionate Southwest seminar, virtual seminar. And now I'll turn it over to uh, back to uh, my friend and colleague, Jeff Bannister, who will field the questions that we've received over the course of this uh, remarkable presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thanks so much to our presenters for these amazing presentations. It's um, so hard to hear and so important to hear. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the, um, the work that you're doing, uh, the research that you've done, um, and also the, the activist work you're doing to help us create you know, resilient communities around this, this scar of militarization that's hitting this, this region. And I mean this region from Tucson all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. <laughs> So thank you. Um, I also want to tell everybody that we, uh, the um, Southern Border Communities Coalition um, we uh, web address is posted in the chat box too, so you can pick it up there. And there's a lot of great information on um, Vicki's organization's website there. Um, so I will just, um, we've got a lot of comments and things and a lot of very supportive comments. So thanks for those. Um, I, and I want to move to the questions, but before I do that, I also want to draw your attention to a couple things in the chat box. One is um, Candace Pardee has made some very interesting comments, and I'm not going to try to synthesize or read them here, but if you have a chance to look at them, there, there's some interesting stuff there. Um, and the first question that we have is from uh, Kirk Astroth, or Astroth, sorry if I didn't get that right there, um, who says, and this is directed to uh, Dr. Green. Um, do you have any hope from the efforts starting from VP Harris and her discussions with the Guatemalan president or is it just more lip service? Um, Kirk, hello. Uh, yes, I'm afraid I think it's more lip service because um, the Guatemalan government is corrupt, deeply corrupt. So I'm not quite sure what kind of negotiations you can make with them in this, uh, you know, uh, country to country kind of uh, way to do that. And you know, for those negotiations to go anywhere, the U.S. would really have to stand up and make it hurt for Guatemala. So to demand an end to impunity, for example, would mean that they'd have to do something about cutting off U.S. aid in a significant way. And I'm not just talking about econo economic aid. I'm talking about military aid. Um, the borders in Guatemala, for example, with Mexico and with Honduras are so heavily militarized. We've talked about this border, but this border extends all the way down to Honduras and Guatemala. We have DEA agents, um, border patrol agents, ICE agents, FBI, CIA, et cetera, et cetera, and mil active duty military on those borders. What are we doing there? and what is going on, because it doesn't stop the drug trafficking at all. And I just want to just add to that, Kirk, that, you know, I think one of the biggest difficulty is how do you, tra how do you address the, the big elephant in the room, the international trafficking organizations? And just in terms of our border here, 80% of the drugs, the lucrative drugs that pass into the United States, cocaine, black tar, heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, come through the ports of entry. So we militarize between the ports of entry in extraordinary ways going after the people least able to defend themselves. 
well, why are these ports of entry allowing 80% of the drugs in? So I, I, I don't have a lot of hope until the Biden administration steps up to militarization, impunity, and corruption. Thank you. Thank you for that, Linda. Um, let's see, we have um, a question from uh, Robert Villa, Beto, I think, if, the, if the, I have the person correct. Um, hello, Beto. This is, um, <clears throat> he writes, are there perceptions of care that actually contribute to necroviolence or symbolic violence? That is, is there a cultural dissonance or something missing in translation that needs to be addressed, i.e. cultural sensitivity training, support for proper disposition and treatment of the deceased, uh, et cetera? Um, surely that's a, that's a big question. Um, yeah, thank you. We chatted a little bit um, as well. Um, so yes, in short, um, it's kind of a whole other um, area of, of work. Um, and I do discuss a, a little bit in the chapter how um, some of the harm that the families experience um, when they've learned that their loved one was autopsied or parts were removed for forensic anthropology examination, I think some of that harm could better be ameliorated through um, communication um, with the families. And one of the challenges is that there's so many, it's like a game of telephone. There's often very many links between, you know, the forensic anthropologist doing the exam and then the families hearing the news from the consulate. Um, but just briefly, I think that um, for sure there's attempts to provide care that where that care isn't translated and received by the family. And I think um, in another piece of work, I'm working on um, really arguing that families be treated as collaborators in the forensic process because they're already involved in forensic investigation on their own in the attempt to find their loved one. So rather than kind of treating them as passive victims who are waiting to receive news, I think some of that care could be better received if they were really treated as partners in the process of identification. But thanks for the question. Thank you, Robin. We have a question from uh, uh, Sandra Lopez, who's, who writes, um, I'm curious to know if any border communities are utilizing DNA technology to identify these unidentified bodies. I'm aware that, that the DNA DOE project, DOE, has been working on identifying some of these people, but is there a centralized organization that prioritizes prioritizes this? That's a great question. Um, I think I can do that one really quickly. Um, I would direct you direct you towards the Colibri Center for Human Rights in Tucson, um, which is providing a non-state, um, non-police involved option for families of the missing. Um, a lot of the state procedures are limited by the fact that you have to report to U.S. law enforcement in order to access DNA services. So um, I think that's, there's that group, and then there's the Argentine forensic anthropology team doing similar work, um, collecting DNA from families who want to submit DNA in Central America and Mexico. Thank you, Robin. Um, let's see, I have... Jeff, there's also a question from Christian Rubalcaba. That's, that I'd be I'm, happy that's to the one I'm trying to, <laughs> if you want to go ahead and uh, uh, ask it, Rebecca, because I'm not seeing it in my... Okay, sure. So um, Christian asks, has there been research on the emotional or health impacts of separation for migrants, family members who remain, remain in the home country? And that's a great question and something that I've actually been interested in researching myself, but have not done yet. But there is quite a bit of research on that. It doesn't tend to be on the emotional aspect as much, but more on tangible health outcomes or school school related like educational outcomes. So we know at, at first it looks like the balance is going to be positive because so much money gets sent home to Mexican families who are separated, right? Uh, remittances have been either the first or second source of foreign direct income in Mexico for several decades now. So it's easy to look at it purely for monetarily. You would assume that maybe the family is doing better. But um, when we actually look at the outcomes for children left behind when their parents migrate, which is where most of the research lies, and that's between 15 and 20% of Mexican children are estimated to have at least one parent who migrates for at least some a substantial portion of their childhood educational outcomes often decline and there are actually even some direct health outcomes related to stature so some of the issues that Tom was speaking about at the beginning in terms of pre-migration stressors so indicating nutritional stress and just really reflecting the stress of 
leaving all of the responsibility for picking up the pieces behind to whatever parent is remaining in Mexico is really, it's a, it really is a very challenging situation. And the other piece that I'll mention that I've seen that's, that's also very, um, sobering but important is that the, the segment of people who are deemed to be most vulnerable for most health outcomes and also just access issues are people who have migrated and returned in a lot of ways because they get stuck between systems in Mexico then coming to the U.S. not I'm speaking specifically for um, healthcare access for example often have pre um barriers to care pre-migration and then get here, don't really know how to navigate the system, have very poor access to the system here, and then are returned to a system that has since changed and often don't really know how to properly navigate that as well. So there are a lot of increased vulnerabilities for people who are really transnational in their movement. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I have now the question from Mark, and then after that, I'm going to go to um, Paco Cantu, who has a question as well. So Mark writes, uh, I have a question for Linda as to whether she, she thought that decriminalizing drugs like cocaine um, would have any effect. Um, yes, I, I'm not quite sure how that would work out, but I think uh, it will, would have a very big effect uh, both on people in this country um, and then those drugs coming across, after all, you're going to decrease a lot of the lucrative uh, work that the, the cartels and everyone else is doing. And I, th I, I think it's such a good question, Mark, because, um, and I don't have time to do it here, but there are very direct links between mass incarceration in the United States and the large numbers of people coming. And... Um, uh, I think it was Jim Dunkerley said a while ago about, you know, we tend to, we tend to lump asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants all under the same umbrella. And, and in some ways that's right, because as Jim Dunkerley said, economic privation is a lot nastier than just simply not having a job. And so what's going on in Central America is very much related to the United States, both in terms of drug policy and drug practices. So yes, I think it, it, it might be one good step forward, but this is so multidimensional that it seems to me that multiple things have to happen as simultaneously as possible, but there really has to be the will. And the cartels, you know, right now, I mean, I think it's, you, one could dispute it, but I am going to say it, the cartels really are in charge of Mexico and most of Central America, and they have moved outward. I mean, they're, you know, they're running drugs from South America to Africa that go up to the Mediterranean across into Europe. So this isn't just our border. This is a global problem. Indeed. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? Okay, so we have, um, I have a question from Barbara Dickens Dickinson, but I think that I'm going to combine that with um, a question from Paco here. Her question is broadly, you know, what, uh, what is to be done? <laughs> um, and so, um, and Paco is, uh, a little more specific about prevention through deterrence. He writes, uh, do any of the panelists have advice for us on how to ensure that uh, prevention through deterrence slash border enforcement caused migration deaths gets uh, centered in democratic slash Biden administration reform plans? And he has uh, reform in, um, in quotes. So far, the issue seems totally absent from any policy discussions. Uh, I, I, yeah, so, so whoever wants to grab that, uh, go for it. <laughs> I would love to start answering that one. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's really interesting that I think that the Biden administration is getting the, at least acknowledging the fact that we have to rethink borders. The problem is that there is such a huge gap between acknowledging the problem and developing a plan to change it, particularly when there's so many um, push factors in place. Like for example, the corporate interest of of private prison companies and, and surveillance technology companies. And, you know, there's just a lot of, um, as, as an old friend of mine used to say, capitalism kills, right? It creates these models where the United States has basically created an economic model that only offers jobs in law enforcement and in security. 
And if we were to try to dismantle that, we would have to find a way to create new jobs. And, and I think that that is behind a lot of the efforts of people who are proposing, um, you know, like the Green New Deal. It's like, let's create new green jobs that will replace what we're basing our economy on, which is basically criminalizing people or, you know, jailing them. <laughs> Um, so that's that's one, and that's a broader answer. But I think that fundamentally, one of our recommendations is, you know, people wouldn't cross in the borders, in the remote regions of the border, if you created more channels of entry and welcoming centers at our ports of entry. So let's create uh, a, a system that actually welcomes people, does a proper assessment, due process, checking if there's any humanitarian or legal remedy um, for them in this country. I, I mean, I think that that will be crucial in saving lives and it will be a lot more, um, it, will be, it will actually cost less than what we spent on building a border wall the last four years, which you know was 16 plus billions of dollars. Um, the other thing though, is that I think there has to be a real way to address the so-called root causes of migration. Unfortunately, we've seen in the past, a good example is like Haiti after the earthquake, the, the major earthquake it experienced, um, that they did give all of this money to Haiti. But if you look at Haiti right now, it's a country that's on fire. And similar things happen with countries in Central America, other Latin American countries where the United States invests money but it doesn't do a proper job. It, it, basically, it invests money that only, again, creates law enforcement models that don't do anything to address the corruption or create um, you know, better paying jobs that aren't based on the crime model in these countries that would keep people at home. So I'll just bring up those few points. Jeff, I'd like to say something following up on Vicky's excellent points is that we need undocumented migrants because they're the cheap labor, the farm workers, the meat packers, the service industry. If we actually pay a living wage to people, then capitalism loses some of their profits. So we want these people. What the border does is keep in control, keep in check how many are coming. And these are really now disposable people. Because if we've been running prevention through deterrence for over 20 years, and for many of us, it's an utter failure with the number of deaths and, and harm that both Rebecca and Robin have uh, indicated, then this isn't a mistake. This is a policy on purpose. And I don't hear Biden talking about that. Sorry, I have to always put in my capitalism, my anti-capitalism take on this, but I, I think it's something that doesn't get brought up enough. We want these people undocumented. Yeah. It keeps the labor force in control. Thank you for bringing that up, Linda. And just to echo that, um, I don't know how many of you watched Biden's address the other night. Um, I was just kind of screaming in my living room when he, he said comprehensive immigration reform, and then it was as if he had a colon, and he said border security. And so to get into the, the final question that I saw in the chat, you know, what can we do now? Um, and Vicky is the right person to answer that question more than me, but I, I also just found what Vicky was saying is we need to really pressure democratic leadership to really look at comprehensive immigration reform and just quit it on defining border security as comprehensive immigration reform, because that's been the tradition over the last 20 years. And the only there's no movement on actually addressing immigration. Thank you, Robin and Linda and Vicki. Excellent. Vicki, did you have something to follow up with on that? Yeah, I just wanted to sharpen the, the point that Robin was making a little bit. Um, I, I just really want people to walk away with this knowledge that no matter how many crocodiles, landmines, and uh, whatever else militarized equipment you throw at the US-Mexico border and completely seal it with all of this military equipment, there will never come a time when they say it's secure, the border is secure. 
So open borders, when they asked me, so do you support open borders? I said, well, the, it will be open perennially. So this just, uh, it's a dog whistle used by anti-immigrants and we should, we should just really call them on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I think that's, uh, that's so important. It's such a red herring and it just short circuits the conversation you know, when people say that. So um, let's see, uh, just going through the questions here. Um, I'm gonna have to jump off here pretty soon. I have to prepare for another meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, me too. I actually have to leave now. Well, this might be a good place to stop there. It looks like a... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's quite all right. We, we said we go to 145. I think, I think the questions are slowing down anyway. So um, thank you everyone so much. Thanks to everyone who showed up today. Um, this has been a really amazing conversation. Um, and I, on, the, on part of behalf of the Southwest Center, I just want to say how thankful, thankful we are for, for everyone. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Vicki, yeah. thanks so much for being Thank here. I'm so glad. Yeah. I wish you could join me on all of my panels. <laughs> <laughs>